Hello and welcome to the Raptor Show on the Sportsnet Radio Network. Make sure you find the Raptor Show wherever you listen to podcasts and subscribe. And please rate and review the show. I'm your host, Wayne Lou. I'm joined by co-host Blake Murphy. We have an action-packed show for you today. Four guests that we will cycle through. Uh, but yeah, first, we start with ourselves, Blake. Uh, what were you doing last night when you got the breaking news from Shams that a trade for Pascal Siakam to the Indiana Pacers was imminent? I had just finished a uh, very nice steak. I had dinner with my pal Steve. Uh, I was almost through a bottle of wine <laughs> and oh, uh, had imbibed in some other things as well. And nice. I was like reacting to it in a way that I was like, oh, man, I hope this doesn't happen tonight because I am uh, I'm not radio ready or, or would not be radio ready for uh, for a little bit there, as uh, I'm sure has happened to you in the past as well. But, yeah, I mean, the, the initial response is uh, or at least the initial reaction is, huh, I'm kind of kind of surprised it, it picked up like the language specificity with how close this is so far out from the deadline still. Yeah. And for people who missed it, um, the report came out yesterday from Sham Sharania and Sam Amick over at the athletic. We're actually going to get Sam Amick on the line shortly. Uh, but uh, the quotes were actively engaged the Raptors and the Pacers in a Pascal Siakam trade to Indiana in exchange for Bruce Brown, quote unquote, other salaries and three unspecified first. And it was described as, quote, far along in the process between the two teams and that multiple proposals were exchanged. However, that happened last night around 8. And right now, it's 2 p.m. Eastern the next day. Still nothing has, has actually been official. Um, maybe more details have come out. And that's why it'll be good to talk to Sam about it. But, yeah, on a personal standpoint, you know, when the news came out, I was having dinner. And I was like, man, I was really looking forward to playing basketball tonight. You know, um, having Sh- played. Shams would never. I was going to say, Shams literally ditched pickup basketball so that he would never miss a scoop. Me, I'm like, look, I, I haven't played in over a month. Um, probably really rusty, you know. Got to get some of this holiday weight off as well. And um, so I, I I texted somebody, quote unquote, in the know to be like, hey, is this actually happening or not? Because I'm trying to hoop. <laughs> and I got enough confirmation to be like, okay, I'm going to go hoop. So in any case, I'm happy it didn't break just yet. But yeah. uh, at least we know that Indiana is very seriously interested and um, to whatever extent that they feel Pascal was willing to resign with them, the fact that they're going to throw three first round picks into this kind of proposal does suggest to me at least that, you know, this at least should be a baseline of what it is. Having said that, though, I'm not exactly thrilled about the return package, but let's start there. What was your thoughts on that? Yeah, so I, on the Pascal resigning front, this is why I don't, and I, I kind of went on a rant about it yesterday a little bit. And this is why I didn't believe it a ton in the offseason, or or I believed it, but I didn't believe it matters a ton. Is like we heard all coming out of the offseason that a Pacers deal got killed because Pascal was not willing to sign an extension there. But now three firsts are still on the table mm-hmm. when you're not able to sign an extension. Like this stuff matters a little bit, but it does not matter enough to like be upset with Pascal Siakam for not agreeing to extend somewhere or to think it's going to kill a deal entirely. Money will talk at the end of the day. So the Pacers are obviously a certain level of confidence with this. There are two big questions that still have to flow from this that will determine, look, I think we we know the base package here and you probably feel a certain way regardless of the specifics. There are two things that we need to find out still. Who are the extra pieces coming back besides Bruce, beside Bruce Brown? That's important for making the salary matching work. We've got some flexibility here because Indiana is actually way below the salary cap. So salary matching doesn't have to work the same as it normally would here Mm -hmm. um, for Toronto and Indiana. But there is a big difference between if that extra piece is an Obi Toppin who comes with his rights and restricted free agency or a Jarris Walker who a lot of people believe can be a rotation player, you know, down the line. He's not there yet, but down the line. Um, Or if it's instead... Jalen Smith, who is as expensive as those guys, but not as good and has a player option for next year, or Jordan Nora, who is not really interesting and headed for free agency. So we need to know who those other pieces are. Then we need to know which of the picks that Indiana controls it's going to be. And Indiana has a good amount of picks. They have eight first round picks in their cash right now. Um, All seven of their own that they can trade over the next seven years, as well as the worst of, and bear with me here, the worst pick of the Thunder, Rockets, Clippers, and Jazz for this coming year. So probably the Clippers' uh, first-round pick for this upcoming year. They've also got a boatload of seconds 
um, and, and some, you know, pick swaps in, in the second rounds in future years as well. We won't concern ourselves with those, but um, you know, there's a big difference between 2029 lottery protected first round pick and 2024 unprotected pick or 2026 unprotected pick. Like mm-hmm. what's the specifics of those picks and protections are matters as well. Um, but the base idea here is it's going to be a pick heavy package, not a prospect heavy package. Yeah, uh, I don't like it. I'm, not, I'm sorry. I just don't. Um, I think that the Raptors, we had this discussion literally yesterday. And if I'm doing the deal with Indiana, I need to walk away with one of their top prospects. I mean, the picks are fine, but you put Pascal in Indiana with, with Tyrese Halliburton. Indiana's going to be a perennial playoff team. Oh, dude, they're going to be so like the fit with Pascal and Indiana. Yeah. The Raptors side of this will will quibble and, and we'll have our opinions. But the Indy side of this is very straightforward to me. For sure. But my point is, you are getting picks that are going to be in the 20s, uh, maybe three picks in the 20s, considering the fact that, like you said, the other pick that they can throw into this, the first rounder, likely is going to be that one that is the worst of four teams, uh, which includes both OKC and uh, the Clippers. So in any case, I'm not a fan of this deal unless you do find that you have taken off one of their key prospects. But let's let's talk to somebody uh, who has direct reporting on this? Uh, Sam Amick from the Athletic. What's going on? I, I, I just talked to you earlier this week, but uh, now you're on my program. What's going on? I know it was it was uh, meant to be here. Thanks for having me, guys. Appreciate it. Uh, Sam, so you you had the co byline with Shams on this reporting. Um, everyone should go check it out at, at the Athletic. Um, how close do you think this is right now to being a reality? Because we are still three weeks and a day out from the trade deadline. Sometimes this stuff happens and it's more of a, Hey, someone's ringing the bell here to be like, get your offers in, get your offers in. This is picking up steam. Um, it, what are your impressions of, of how close a Pascal to Indiana deal is to being a reality right now? Well, Blake, I think that's a fair framing of it. Um, it's somewhat akin to what seems to have happened with, Sacramento uh, last week or 10 days ago, whenever that was, where on the King side, it was pressing and it was, you know, them pushing and seemingly getting closer uh, and, and, you know, a lot of noise. Uh, but Toronto has continued, and, and Masai Ujiri obviously has continued to keep the other side guessing a lot of times in these talks um, where even when it ramps up and the offers, you know, get better and, and more significant. Uh, there's still that feeling that he might go ahead and drag it out until the deadline. And really because, as you guys know better than anybody, I, I do think, I don't know what percentage chance I would put on it, you know, the prospect of him just going ahead and, and holding tight here and, and not doing something does remain. Uh, so in that regard, you know, we admittedly were not able to get full clarity yesterday on the Raptors side. Uh, and, I, and I do think that the Pacers, you know, were, were hopeful that it could get done here. But there was a sense also that there was a little kind of deal fatigue uh, mm. when it comes to these talks. Got you. Well, um, the previous reporting around this was that the Raptors are looking for players who are able to play and contribute or have already established themselves. The OG trade kind of demonstrated that they bring in two guys in Emmanuel quickly and RJ bear who are young, but also have established that they're good to, to, to really good NBA players, depending on how they grow. Um, and the speculation was that the return for the Pascal trade would be similar. Um, was there push or any talk from the Raptors side in terms of trying to get a Jairus Walker, get a Benedict Matherin, get an Andrew Nemhard, um, you know, in addition to these picks or maybe instead of these type of picks? Yeah, so that part does seem to be part of the talks. Uh, and, and Jake Fisher uh, of Yahoo, uh, he, to his credit, kind of advanced it today a little bit with his reporting on, on the idea that, that Matherin and Jarris Walker were obstacles in the talks. And it, to this point, Indiana had not been willing to include them. Uh, you know, and also the fact that, uh, that Jordan Wara was, was part of the framework of what was put on the table. Um, you know, on our side, it was a focus more so on those picks. I heard you guys perspective, you know, rightly so on the quality of those picks because you hear three firsts and you obviously, generally speaking, say, damn, that, that should get any deal done for the most part when it comes to, uh, you know, a player of this caliber. Um, but what kind of first are they going to be? I, I do not believe that they are uh, all unprotected. That obviously matters a great deal as well. Um, so a lot to consider. The one thing that, that we didn't really highlight that I do think is fair to share too is, you know, and, and this is tough to 
completely unpack, but the discussion about Pascal and how he sees his free agency, um, I, I definitely do not get the sense. Like if you compare the Pacers situation to the Sacramento situation, I don't get the sense that they're the same at all. It, it does uh, sound like there'd be a lot more willingness on Pascal's side to consider a longer term future in Indiana, which, you know, should compel their front office to, to put more on the table. So, okay. So from the Indiana side of this, um, they are, if they're able to maneuver this without Buddy Heald in the deal and, and they can keep Buddy Heald because he's such a good fit or look for him in, in another potential deal, maybe think of something long-term since he's a UFA after the, after the, uh, after the season. Um, I mean, would you, if you're Indiana, would you be quibbling on the prospect stuff or is Pascal enough of a fit that you kind of just, you know, if it takes uh, Jairus Walker, but those picks are protected and and it gets you over the finish line. Like this is, uh, this is an analysis question, not a reporting question. Um, Your, your willingness, if you're the Pacers to just get this done, given the level of fit that Pascal is with that team on the court. I'd be, I'd be nervous because you're giving up the assets, which are significant. And, you know, in terms of the picks and then Matherin in particular has been a really good part of your program. You found something there, you know, Walker's got a lot of upside. Um, and again, in the absence of a, a 100% promise that he's not going anywhere, I would lose sleep over that. If I was Kevin Pritchard, um, I might go ahead and do it. And I, and if I got to pick a side, I would probably say, you know, I mean, it's, I don't want to lose both those guys. But I would find a way to get this deal done. And ultimately, and this is me just predicting handicapping, I I would put the Pacers at the front of this line. I think if anybody's getting it done right now, it feels like it would be them. But I think the other part of their calculus is the fact that the small market component means that in free agency, you're you're always going to have to find a way to get top-tier talent your way by trade and then try to recruit them, try to convince them to stick around. I think that part of it, the small market factor, um, you know, it's a good fit in that regard. Um, the Kings, you, you can make the same type of argument for them, but not only does he not seem to want to be there, but they actually, I think, are further along when it comes to their core uh, than the Pacers are. The Pacers are, are trying, obviously, to, to surround Tyrese Halliburton with special players. And Pascal being 29, still having a good runway when it comes to his prime, would be a really good fit. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a risk worth, ta- worth taking, I think, and and one that would be fascinating to monitor and, and not really all that indifferent from the one that got them Halliburton in the first place. You know, I mean, they came off a two-time all-star and some bonus to go after a young guy in Tyrese that paid off. Uh, we didn't know at the time that, that it would work out like it did. And this has got a, a little shade of that for me. Seb, I want to ask, going back to something you said earlier, um, you know, clearly there were a trades and tests or talks intensified last night and, um, you know, there was optimism, as you mentioned, from the Indiana side that this deal was going to get done. Um, but a little bit of fatigue, maybe potentially dealing with the Raptors front office. Where do you think that comes from? Is is that because we've heard other kind of reports of that as well in terms of other front offices dealing with the Raptors, not fully sure that they'll actually go through with deals. Is this another instance of that or was this something else where it's just like they actually did have the talks, but you know, they might just have more talks and, and it's just a little bit frustrating because you're close to the, the, the goal line, but you're not actually through. No, Will, it's a fair question. And I think, you know, again, it's always hard to get total clarity on these things, but mm-hmm. the, the mood and the emotion, I guess, of both situations does feel very similar. Um, the Kings had a fair amount of angst, if you will, during that period of the talks mm-hmm. where it was, I mean, they they went out of their way to, broadcast that they were out of the talks, you know, about 12 hours after the news broke that they were in the talks. Right. Um, which kind of showed that it was like a, you know what, we need a break. And, and maybe it's just a break. Maybe they're out completely. But the Pacers, you know, had the same type of vibe. Um, Masai is, is a hard bargainer. And then I also think you do hear some chatter that from a communication standpoint that, you know, Bobby Webster being very prominent, relevant, uh, important in that environment, um, you know, that sometimes you have a kind of perception not meeting reality when it comes to the team that they're talking to and what they think it's going to take to get a deal done. That's obviously the kind of stuff that leads to deal fatigue. Um, and, and so, yeah, I am hearing some of that right now. And even to take it over to Pascal's side, you know, I think even him and, and his camp, I've uh, been puzzled by just not knowing exactly how the Raptors wanted to play this. They have not 
you know, categorically told him that, that we don't want a future with you. You know what I mean? So they don't, they don't really ever close any doors. I mm. think that's the, maybe yep. that's the frustration is that uh, the people coming after him that would like to have him on their team or Pascal himself, uh, that they don't get much clarity because the, the Raptors front office seems to keep each and every door open, you know, in perpetuity until a deal goes down. Uh, Sam, before we let you go here, this is, I, I guess, semi-related to the, you know, you you just laid out a good case why this is maybe, you know, not quite at the finish line yet. The the deal fatigue around the NBA when it comes to maybe working with this Raptors front office. Uh, another thing that crossed my mind is, and, and look, it doesn't have to be all part of one deal. You could turn around and do it in a subsequent deal as well. Um, do you think, do you imagine there's any element of canvassing the league to see what the what the return might be on Bruce Brown if Bruce Brown were to be rerouted elsewhere obviously only 27 a, a nice player some flexibility with the team option for next year but it, theoretically if the Raptors did not view Bruce Brown as anything other than the salary matching in this piece um, do you think there there'd be a market to reroute him somewhere as well I think so certainly I mean we always obviously and, and for good reason get hung up on the contract but still a very good player a champion, uh, a very unique player, um, you know, who can be used in, in quite a few different ways and has really found himself the last couple of years. Uh, you know, I think Bruce's market should be decent. It's a, you know, it's a fairly high number. Um, and I don't know why I had it in my head the other way, Blake. Is it, it's a player option next year. Team, team option. Team option. Okay. Yeah. So that flexibility um should you know should help their their case um and that definitely could be part of this is that um not only canvas in the market for for bruce but you know we keep talking kings pacers the uh the kind of increasing of the decibel level in those two situations the the benefit for the raptors is both times the world kind of saw in the nba world uh you know what it what what wasn't good enough, if that makes sense. And so they are continuing to, I think, apply pressure, apply pressure to that Pascal market with the hopes of extracting as much as possible. Got you. All right. Well, Sam, we appreciate your time. Thanks for uh, being available. And um, we'll look forward to hearing more details around this trade. This is something we're going to talk about every day on the Raptors show. So Sam, may make up the other. Thanks, sure. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Appreciate you. Be Thanks, good. Sam. There you go. Um, any quick takeaways from that? Uh, it just, I mean, that it's helpful because because we always get instant questions when uh, when news like this comes out is like who's leaking this or why or like why did the news come out if it's not done? Yeah. I thought the insight on you know how a deal gets ninety percent of the way there and then what has to make up that last ten percent was really helpful background information of, of like the deal fatigue, recanvassing the league. You know, do the Kings come back to the table now? That that yeah. kind of thing is important to keep in mind. Um, this and is then, why I think it's easier to do things against a deadline because you don't yes. even have time to go back and like do yeah. all these kind of little things. I mean, you know me, yeah. I, I'm a nerd, so I didn't like grind out like assignments until the, the last minute. Yeah, but there yeah. was a reason that a lot of people do Yeah, because it kind of kicks the you, the adrenaline kicks in the your other options are, are out of there. Um, and then I guess the other thing I thought was. You know, Sam, in addition to being a reporter, is a very smart basketball analyst and him feeling similar to what I feel at a national level that, yeah, if you're the Pacers and you're this willing to be in the deal, like should I, I'm and I'm not saying you throw Jairus Walker in for free. Mm. I'm saying if that if a pick comes off the table or the protections Dude, change or that. whatever, yeah. whatever the case a guy who is not even remotely in your rotation right now being the sticking point in a deal like this seems, you know, a little like even if you're going to get Pascal yeah. and your intent is to resign him, he's like, going to block Jairus Walker the whole time. That's why I want Masai and Bobby to keep pushing on this. Like, I, yeah. it's fine that, like, and like, look, I'll settle for fatigue. Aaron Neesmith or Andrew Nembar. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. I'll, I'll yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. I'd even in a pinch take, oh, wow, it's done. Woj. Okay. We have breaking Holy news. Holy cow. All right, what's the deal then? Uh, Bruce Brown, Jordan Wara, and three first-round picks. Uh, New Orleans will be a third team in the deal, sending Kira Lewis Jr. to the Raptors. That is per Adrian Wojnarowski okay. of ESPN. We have right. uh, a trade live. Uh, Pascal to the Pacers. Yeah, well, I guess I, I, I think we not. I think we don't take a break now. Uh, we were going to take a break. Matt yeah. Devlin's waiting outside the studio. We can maybe get him in here and uh, get his opinion. Uh, momentarily, but we're not going to take a break now. We're 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 just going to keep rolling. Sure. Yeah, um, so Shams also reporting it now that it's uh, a Bruce Brown and three first round pick packages. Woj again, including that it's Jordan Noara and New Orleans will be involved here somewhere with Kira Lewis Jr. 
coming back to Toronto. Yeah. New Orleans motivation in this, I would imagine having been going through uh, the all the cap and trade situations and stuff, uh, this could get New Orleans below the tax. Mm -hmm. So who knows? Maybe there's another second coming back to Toronto right. or something like that. We'll see. Um, but Will, we kind of didn't get a chance to get our full takes in uh, because we had Sam Mamick on the line, but this is done now, and it is Bruce Brown as the main salary piece. The fact that Woj and Shams are not including a prospect, uh, it's just Jordan Wara, says that it's not going to be Nampart, Neesmith, Jairus Walker, or anything like yeah. that. We don't know the details on the three picks yet. Um, man, how are you feeling? Man. Disappointing. Not going to lie. Very disappointed. Um, the picks are, again, we'll see more details on these picks, but they are most likely going to be picks in the 20 range. I don't even know if we have a pick that's even in the teens based on this because it's most likely, as you mentioned, the extra pick that Indiana holds, uh, which is likely going to be the Clippers pick oh, or OKC's pick. Um, so the pick details, both of their 2024 first rounders and Indy's 2026 first rounder. Yeah. Uh, the Pelicans are actually sending the second round pick to Indiana cool. uh, to help them get under the tax. So it is two first rounders. So the Raptors will now have two picks in the 20s mm -hmm. uh, or a late teens and, and 20s pick as well as the number 31 pick in this draft. So yeah. they now have three picks between, say, eight, if 17 and 31 in the draft. Clearly, they didn't even value this draft in the first place because they traded away a top six protected pick for Jacoperto last year. So to me, we are now getting three picks in uh, in, in this deal that are going to be in the 20s uh, because Indiana is going to be a winning fr a franchise. And you don't get any of their immediate prospects, as we just mentioned. You get Jordan Noir, who could come in and, and be a decent shooting guard for you, I suppose. Largely probably going to be a bench player right now. And then Bruce Brown, who is not going to factor into your long-term future here. And you traded away an all-NBA player. Like, I understand that, you know what, this might be the best deal. It probably is the best deal on the table. But when you look at from the fact that you've had Pascal on your program for this long, you've had him essentially on the trade block for like two, three summers now. This cannot be the best deal that you could have to get done. I'm sorry. It's a very disappointing result. You can't even get Jairus Walker from them. You can't get one of their guards. And, and you give them to Indiana, who I, I think Pascal is going to flourish in Indiana. Uh, put aside all that other stuff. Like but I from said the earlier, when we didn't have a lot of time to, to go more. into it. Yeah, right, I'm sorry. We need to get more. This it's is great for Indiana. Like, uh, imagine you're in the Pacers position here. And yeah, you, yeah, gave, you, up, you gave up great. three first round picks. But your team who is cares? already loaded with a full second unit yeah. of prospects. Yeah. You turned Bruce Brown, who was like a fun, oh, we'll use it, use mm -hmm. the cap space to actually add someone who can, you know, help teach these guys to play. You've turned that into Pascal Siakam. Mm -hmm. It's a pretty big deal. No, he's going to thrive there. There's and like, no look, guess what? Even if Pascal's camp hasn't had talks with them or whatever, or, or wasn't initially eager to sign an extension, whatever the truth in that is, he's going to go there, play with Tyrese Halliburton and Buddy Heald in a system that has so much space offensively, mm -hmm. is going to let him run, is going to let him attack one-on-one -on -one instead of facing double teams all the time. Yeah. He's going to get more stats, more efficiently. He's going to play on a playoff team. He's going to have so much fun there. I'd be, I would be very surprised both because Indiana's putting three picks in the deal, mm -hmm. but also because the fit is so good on court. I'd be surprised if Pascal isn't really happy there eventually too. Yeah. Look, I, I think Pascal is going to be great in Indiana. Like the, the situation is going to be good for him. Uh, they are going to be willing to pay him. I think he's going to be there long-term again. I just think that the Raptors did not get full value on an all NBA player. Yeah, and I Period. mean, and, and, and that is, and, and that's it. Whether I mean. that's now or whether that's, you know, if better value was there this time last year or at yeah. the draft or on July 1st or whatever. And this is what we've talked about is like, if you keep pushing it down the line, and look, it worked out. It worked out well with uh, with OG. Like it worked mm -hmm. out fine. Mm -hmm. uh, you you ended up still getting very good value for him despite waiting it out and rolling it down the line. But Pascal's three years older and is seeking a max. Like you. You missed the window to really get full value on that. And I get that they wanted to try some things. They wanted to try a new coach. There was the possibility of an extension, et cetera. But yeah, I think you missed the window on, on the value there. On top of which, like, I don't know, it's just such an underwhelming and unfortunate ending to Pascal's era in Toronto from sure. like a relationship standpoint as well, which is obviously not what fans yeah. care about in the immediate return. But let me ask you this way. Would you have traded three first round picks, which is that's the bulk, the crux of the deal. Like at the Bruce Brown, the Jordan Noir piece are kind of just there to make the money work. I'm not dismissing them as players, but they're not really going to be changing the bottom line for you. They're, they're making this deal for the three picks. Would you rather have three picks? Would you trade three picks right now? These three picks for uh, Emmanuel quickly and RJ Barrett? 
Uh, no, I wouldn't trade the three picks. So we got be- less for Pascal than we got for OG. Yeah, I think that's fair. I would trade. Two, I would deal. trade two firsts for Emmanuel quickly, even heading into RFA. But like RJ's contract, we've talked about that. Even though like, even though RJ's been good, like there were some people who thought that that was not a good contract, and you might have to actually pay teams to um, to take him on. Yeah, and who, I, look, it's always going to be something where you look back ten years down the line. Depends where those picks end up, who you pick with those picks, whatever. Uh, but again, it's just, it's hugely underwhelming. You couldn't even get one of their prospects. Yeah. And you got one of New Orleans prospects who just like isn't really. And was there an all urgency that... to do it now? Like, even for example, you get back to 2024 pick, you've now given Indiana Pascal Siakam. If you gave him to him three weeks later, does that change one or two wins? Does that change one or two slots in the draft position? Is that deal off the table from Indiana three weeks from now? I don't think so. Yeah. Because they're getting Pascal Siakam essentially and like, for like, like one guy out right now. Like, yeah, it's uh, it's tough. And like, I don't know, maybe maybe wow. they bluff that, hey, we're going to take these three first round picks and go mm-hmm. elsewhere. But like the other names on the market aren't th- aren't as good a fit as Pascal. There. Like maybe they pay the same for DeJounte and DeJounte has more controllability, but he's not nearly as good of a fit there on a team that's already guard heavy. Zach Levine doesn't really do anything for a team that's already so good offensively mm-hmm. and has nothing uh, defensively. Um, Lewis, by the way, for anyone who's curious, has completely fallen out of the rotation in New Orleans. He was at one point a pretty interesting, like he was a lottery pick a couple years ago. Yep. Um, looked like he would maybe be a, a piece of the future in New Orleans. It never really clicked. He's headed for restricted free agency at the end of this year with a qualifying offer that's high enough that the Raptors are not going to qualify him. He's basically an expiring contract that is just in this deal to help New Orleans out and Indy picks up a second to uh, to to make it uh, work. Um, so yeah, this is... Uh, this is underwhelming. Uh, Pascal Siaka, for anyone who's missed it or is just tuning in, and we're, apologies, we're, we're kind of changing things on the fly here uh, on the show. Matt Devlin is going to join us momentarily. We have Mark Stein coming on with us at 3 p.m., uh, so we'll get more of his insights into this. But the headline item is that Pascal Siakam is headed to the Indiana Pacers in a three-team deal. The Raptors will get back two 2024 first-round picks, a 2026 first-round pick. We do not know the protections. I'd imagine the two this year are unprotected since they figure to be in the back half anyway. 2026, maybe they quibble over the protections. Um, they'll also pick up Kira Lewis, who is uh, not much to to factor in here. A really nice piece of business for the Pacers, maybe a little less so for the Toronto Raptors. Uh, Will, I'm going to kick it to you to tread water here for a second because I need to physically change no, no, just the spacing here. Just let oh, us in the Mac yeah. can sit there. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay, I was going to try to alter our spacing here a no, little it's, bit. It's all, it's all good. Yeah, Matt, Matt Devlin's going to sit in the uh, the Alex Wong seat here. He's going to turn on um, the on button on the microphone. Yeah. yeah. If this right there, on button, yes. Matt, what's going on, man? We well, who to, knew? We I mean, to, I was scheduled to... to come in, and and then I'm outside getting a coffee. Mark and yeah. I were, were talking, and he comes... Uh, in with the with the news yeah big news okay what are your initial reactions to uh pascal going to indiana and the raptors getting back three first well i think number one i think we all felt that this was going to happen right it was just not if it was when and so it's today i've been saying probably for the last i don't know three weeks or so if i was indiana i would go get him mm-hmm. right i mean you know, not talking from a Raptor perspective. Yeah, yeah. If I was Indiana, I'd go get him. If I was Dallas, I would certainly, uh, you know, be uh, in the conversation as well. But I really believe that with the spacing that Indiana has to get somebody like Pascal that can go downhill, um, I, I think it elevates them. Mm-hmm. Uh, clearly, uh, if this does all go through and again being reported Woj is reporting it so we yep. we can be you know confident in that report that the Indiana Pacers are uh certainly inclined to give him the max right mm-hmm. and so this resets from a Raptor perspective I like it from the Indiana perspective and and for the Raptors perspective you knew that this was going to happen and it resets the timeline And we all know, because we've talked about this in the past, whether it's on the air, off the air, that the Raptors got to a place where they wanted to, based upon Scotty Barnes, Mm -hmm. who, if we all talked today uh, and thought about where the draft was when he got drafted, 
you could have a real nice conversation that he should be the number one pick of that draft. Mm. Right. Yeah. Fair. And so here he is in his third year, he's elevated. He has put together these numbers that are exceptional. And now you have IQ quickly. Who's 24. You have RJ who's 23. And you now have these three first round picks. And then the interesting piece is going to be Bruce Brown because the reality of that situation, and, and real quick, just to wrap up the timeline, I think that the Raptors were thinking, okay, we have this young core of three players. Mm. Pascal's 29. When we're really ready to make that leap, yep. right? How old will he be, mm-hmm. right? So the interesting piece here will be, to me, does Bruce Brown stay with the Raptors or – is this now give them time potentially, as we know, mm. to maybe do something else? Because he would be coveted for a team that is in the upper echelon trying to make a move in the postseason based upon his history, obviously most recent with Denver. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, his contract's nice too because for a team acquiring him, um, you know, it, it's it's a team option. Yep. It's a big number, but at the same time, he's also a productive player. Take a chance. If it doesn't work out, you can move on to the next kind of thing. Right. I think from the Raptors' perspective, it makes sense that they want to reset. It makes sense they want to move forward with the timeline. I did feel like very strongly that Indiana has a lot of good prospects that I would like yeah. to see in Toronto. Um, I agree love, with that. Love to see Andrew Nemhard. I understand that we already have Emmanuel Quickly, who is stationed in as point guard, but I would have loved to see Nemhard play alongside of him. I would have loved to see a Benedict Matherin potentially join this kind of deal. And maybe he's played so well in the first two years that he's not possible in this kind of deal. I totally get it. At minimum, Jairus Walker, who is largely played in the G League this year, mm-hmm. the I think the eighth pick from this last year's draft. Um, he is a forward. He's a guy who I, I, I liked, at, at least in the, the draft kind of like scouting kind of process. And... You know, he is now going to be blocked by Pascal in Indiana, at least to see if you can get that back. I mean, to get back three picks, it sounds good, but those picks are in the 20s. Right. I I, 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 I don't disagree with you. I, I think that if you speak to the Raptors, I, I'm sure privately, you know, they're thinking, yes, it would be ideal mm-hmm. to get back Walker, uh, to get back... Um, a Matherin. Um, but the rea- there's there's a difference between that and reality. Okay. Right? And, right? and reality is you have a player on an expiring contract that clearly is not in your future. That is an all-NBA player. And what is the marketplace for that player? And everybody knows he wants a max deal. And how many people want to pay him a max deal? And I'm sure that really narrowed the field. Now, we can have a debate about whether or not he's deserving or not deserving. Mm -hmm. Sacramento didn't want to give up Keegan Murray, Mm -hmm. right? That's why that, I mean, everybody can talk about, like, you know, when Harrison Barnes' name got mentioned and all that. And, you know, Golden State, whatever. And, you know, all these different, the team... If you broke everything down in the mix, Indiana, Dallas, and for Indiana, they clearly did not want to part with any young talent. Mm-hmm. And and so if you're the Raptors, you look around and you say, okay, what is the best deal on the table? And the best deal on the table was this deal. Mm. You just got three first-round picks. And we know that this is an organization that has drafted well, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And then you also know that there will there are other expiring contracts currently on the books. And I'm not sure this is the last deal that they do. I don't think so either. Because, because you yeah. now have some first round picks mm-hmm. that you can now package and maybe bring something back. Or, so, or even if you, you know, one of the criticisms is going to be that, um, you know, there are not, there's no lottery pick in this deal, say. But you now have, you know, three picks, like we mentioned mm-hmm. when we, uh, the initial reaction here, you do have three picks now, say, between 
17 and 31 in yeah. this draft. If you are bad enough and get some lottery fortune, um, you could also then have, you know, a top six pick as well. Like you, you do have some flexibility to use these now, then, then you get into a situation there though, where it's like, okay, well you got three picks. If you are then packaging those to, to move them for something else, you know, how you frame this trade changes, but assets are assets. And, and those first round picks, you know, let's say you, you really love a guy at number three in the draft or something like that. Suddenly you have, you know, potentially as many as four picks in the top 32. You, you can do some stuff with that, but it sh I don't think it's the initial way you're, you're interpreting yeah. these picks. Right. And, and I would say this, uh, let's go back to when Pascal Siakam was drafted 27th overall in the same draft that Jakob Perto was drafted ninth. Mm -hmm. I think everybody knows in the league and I've been um, in the league since 1999 when I first appeared on NBA TV, uh, dot com, it was called back then. And, and before going to the Grizzlies, I, you know, I think everybody understands that there's a little bit of element, unless you have Victor Wembenyama, unless you have Tim Duncan as a number one overall pick, unless you have LeBron James as a number one overall pick, there, there's a little bit of luck involved. Oh, yeah, totally. Right. And, and so, you know, Yak was taking ninth, Pascal 27th. Mm -hmm. in a draft and they've both ended up I mean think about that not only quality NBA players solid NBA players but one of them's an all NBA player mm -hmm. and I remember the draft night uh report that came out that evening about the pick of Siakam mm -hmm. and it wasn't pretty the reaction was not strong I, no I it was not and so I these things play out which is why I like the RJ deal and the quickly deal um, and because you have two starters for one in OG, who, by the way, was not a lottery pick, who was what? A 20th overall pick. Again, mm -hmm. Raptors, Masai, and Bobby have done really well. You can talk about Bruno. You get it. Mm -hmm. But outside of the lottery, they hit a home run in the lottery, top five yep. with Scotty. Yep. I mean, home run. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows that. And now you have some other picks where they've done exceptionally well. And now the question is, do they take this and now make another move? And that, to me, with the date that you, you, you do this on, January 17th, it allows you now to position yourself over the course of the next three weeks to potentially do even more as you continue to reshape. Yeah. No, but again, this, mm -hmm. goes back, this goes back to... Pascal, and by the way, one of the greatest Raptors of all time. Yep, absolutely. And a lot of kudos to him, what he was a part of in 2019, mm -hmm. because that's it now. I mean, yeah, yes, Chris Boucher, but he didn't play during that run. Yep. Right? And you got three first-round picks for him. Mm -hmm. And everybody, as we know, talked about different players that were getting, you know, Oh, you were offered four last year for OG or whatever that was potentially Memphis, supposedly. Mm -hmm. um, but you got three first round picks when everybody knew you were moving them. Yeah. That's not easy. Yes. And that is he true. wanted a max. There were, there were a lot of circumstances that came into this. It wasn't clear if he was going to re-sign in these places. By the way, it seems like he is willing to re-sign in Indiana, and yeah. it sounds like Indiana is willing to pay him. Correct. So this is good. You you have found the correct match, and you did work out a trade where you got some value out of it. I guess my question is, if you were to know that this is the situation you're walking into, was there a window where last year at the draft, last year in free agency, even the year before that last trade deadline when the Raptors decided, you know what, let's let's try to give it one more push. Let's bring in Jakob Pertl to add a center to this group, see how they balance out. And, of course, they flamed out. Uh, were there missed opportunities back then? And I think that you could only really get that kind of conversation out of Masai and Bobby directly. Yeah. That's but, hindsight's twenty twenty. as Hindsight is twenty twenty for sure. But there were six games under 500 last year at the trade deadline. Right. They had a window there. They had a window at the draft, for agency. And now you have the three picks. And look, the three picks are good. I agree with you, Matt. The Raptors have shown an ability to draft really well with the low picks. But, Blake, I'll ask you that question. Do you think there was a, a window potentially earlier that they could have done this or a different way that they could have approached this that could have netted you a better return than this? Definitely a different way because I think at this point, you know, the league was probably, yes, the, maybe the Raptors and Pascal Siakam's camp were at some point willing to come back to do an extension or resign. But if I'm a, a team, if I'm the team's uh engaging in those discussions, I'm calling that bluff mm -hmm. and I'm not, I'm not putting the assets in as if that's a, a real 
other option because the, you know, look at Grange's piece today that came out. Look at Grange's reporting throughout the year. Look at what we've put together. Like the way that the relationship between the Raptors and Siakam has been handled was such that I don't know that you could have reliably leaned back on, ah, we'll just re-sign him after. You you have to give us everything we want because we'll just keep him. You had signaled too much that you didn't think the timeline. The yeah, and you, you, and you signaled too much that you didn't think the timelines fit and things like that. So I think mm -hmm. they lost some leverage with that. I think they absolutely should have, and, and this is not calling it after the shot misses. I said this mm -hmm. at the time. I said this at last year's deadline. Last year at like the, the start of free agency was the time to do this mm -hmm. because then the trade value is at least a little higher because, well, first of all, trades are easier because everyone has cap space or, or more cap flexibility and things like that. You could also then reshape your own roster around the Scotty idea and a new coach and things like that rather than, you know, what now is like kind of wasting four or five months of, you know, figuring out the answer to a question you already knew the answer to. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, you would have, the teams you were trading with, if they were worried about being able to re-sign Pascal Siakam, would have had the window of time to extend him. And that was gone once you entered the season and things like that. So I don't know if we're talking, you get Jarris Walker back in this deal, or you get Keegan Murray in a deal, or Jalen Johnson or whatever, or it's something as simple as those picks are unprotected because you have that extra bit of leverage. I don't know exactly what that what that looks like, but I do think that you lost the you you lost leverage by not doing this in the offseason when the teams acquiring Pascal and what you could do post Pascal all made a lot more sense for just a little bit more flexibility. Yeah, I'm not sure that I'm not sure that those deals necessarily would have been there. And and I'm only saying that because I think if if some of those deals were there, I think they would have moved on those deals, right? Based upon I think one of the things that we we know is that when Masai and Bobby make a move you know, they let things marinate. And that goes back to his time in Denver. Uh, certainly was the case with OG, and I loved that deal. Mm -hmm. That right? was a good deal. I like that, too. I mean, that deal to me, because do you want to pay OG 40? No. And so here, here, so this is where we go with this, right? It's OG 40, Pascal 50, right? Yeah. And then you know you're going to have to extend Scotty. Mm -hmm. And there you go. Those are your three yep. because as we know, and Blake knows more than any of us it, with the new collective bargaining agreement in that second apron, it's going to be extremely difficult to have more than two max guys on your team. Mm -hmm. And that third guy, do you want him at 40? Yep. Right. And so this becomes kind of that big conversation about, I, I think that, the OG deal was an exceptional deal. I don't think that they're done yet. Um, and I think that ultimately, when you're able to get three first-round picks for a player that is expiring, yep. I name me the last player in the NBA on an expiring contract that you were able to get three first-round picks. I hear you. The Knicks would have given you three first round picks for OG, but they got they you got you wanted players instead of uh, correct, picks correct, in that Because you wanted two for one, and I'm sure. Yeah. Look, we all know, based upon all the reports that are out there, from Shams and Woj and Michael Grange and yeah. you know everyone else that yeah they wanted a young player in the deal, mm -hmm. and clearly Indiana, you know, stood their ground on that. Yeah, and and so when somebody stands their ground on that, what what do you, what do you do? Do you do you just keep holding out, or do you think that you know what we've held, the cards are on the table, mm -hmm. we got to make a move, right? Yeah. I hear that. I hear that. Look, uh, unless you're not happy, I, I'm not happy because I think you could have squeezed Indiana for more. But hey, listen, maybe maybe not. I mean, like in that room, in that time, time, like don't you think the squeezing was happening here? I'm sure the squeezing was happening. <laughs> I mean, in this they've situation. been squoze. I mean, like, I think there's been a lot of, I'm uh, not sure there's right. any juice left. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That's the job with the, that's the job of the GM and the president. It's the, you know, um, okay. Look, I, I don't think it's a, it's, it's like, it's not like they get nothing. It's not like when Fred walked and it was like, all right, well, that, that was a little tough, but this situation, at least you get the first round picks moving aside from the deal itself. The three of us have all covered Pascal Siakam's career in its entirety to this point. And as you mentioned, Matt, hugely important player in franchise history, NBA champion. Does he? I feel like it needs to be said more often that he was the second leading scorer yeah. for the Raptors in their championship run. And when it was 
a one point game and the Raptors called their final timeout uh, of game six, the play that they came out of that was not a play for Kyle, was not a play for Kawhi. They put Kyle Lowry and Pascal in a pick and roll and Kyle found Pascal slipping back door and Draymond went for that reach and I'm so happy he did because Pascal read it, picked up the ball and scored, put up the floater that put the Raptors up three. That was the last basket scored uh, for the Raptors and that clinched game six for them. I'm not saying he hit the Kawhi shot. It's not the same magnitude, but that shot still stays with me so much and his journey from being the 27th pick being the guy who very few teams even scouted uh, because he played in a, in, in a weaker conference, because he was more of an unknown, because he picked up basketball at the age of 16, 17, because even in that draft, the Raptors still had Jakob Proto ahead of him, and he got so pissed off that then when he saw Jakob in the draft, he was cooking him, he was trying to get at him and stuff, just motivated him, goes to the D-League, wins uh d-league mvp for the finals that year uh blake i know you were there for that too i sure was i got the ring i, lo- I love Bench the guy mob, and you're most you, improved you're, all-star all yeah, nba you're, like you're, he did everything he could as a rapper you, really you're did. a thousand percent right yeah and i'm gonna add this mm-hmm. the first thing you said is bang on yeah people forget he was the second option yeah he was the two, because there's always a lot of debate about, yeah, is yeah. he a one, is he a two, is he th- whatever. I, o- I always say to people, when Kawhi walks in, and this is when that deal went down, he's going to walk in that locker room and everybody knows who the guy is. Oh, yeah. Right? And then everybody slots in after that. I mean, the depth of that team, we could go on and have a, a whole other conversation to just how crazy deep that team was and how great they were. Because, you know, unfortunately, you know, as we know, um, you know, the the following year with uh, the stoppage of play in the pandemic, things changed in the bubble. But uh, he uh, was that second uh, option in game one NBA finals. 32, oh, man. Yeah. 32. On like 14 of 17 shooting. Right. 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 Like yeah. just against Draymond Green. Right. Right. Like yeah. it's like on the biggest Man. stage. Yeah. And so if you're Indiana, you have a guy that's already won a ring or and you mm-hmm. have now him next to Halliburton. Yeah. The question for them is defending. And mm-hmm. I've talked to some people in Indiana and they're hoping that, you know, he can provide, you know, from a defensive standpoint, a wing defender and, and yeah, what yeah. have you. Sure. And, and, and so, you know, that, That'll uh, all play out. But um, Pascal is going to go down as one of the greatest Raptors, just like Kyle, just like DeMar, mm-hmm. right? And all of that has happened over the last decade. And it's been an unbelievable ride. And now, as as people have been saying for, what, the last three years since Tampa, mm-hmm. you know, oh, hit reset, reset, reset. Yeah, yeah. And, and so here it is. Here's the reset. Right. And we have a whole fan base that has never lived through it because they've forgotten yeah, about Tampa. I know. And and I as you know, this is my sixteenth year. I've been here when yeah. there's been twenty three wins. Well, and, people don't know about your Bobcats era. And, well, the Bobcats era <laughs> and the, the Grizzlies before yeah, Hubie yeah. Brown showed up. But yeah. winning is not easy in this league. It's not. And winning with young players is not easy. And it takes a little bit of time. And this is going to take a little bit of time. Yeah. Um, but I do think that you get that initial kind of, okay, we now know it's Scotty. Yep. There's no more questions. Yep. It's Scotty. And the time is now, mm-hmm. right? Like, let's see those three specifically grow together. Yeah. And I think it's a great place to start, quite frankly. Mm-hmm. When you – it is – and I've thought about this, you know, a lot. When you think about championship caliber teams that win a title, that contend as the Raptors have and did, it is extremely difficult to hit that reset. Look at what Golden State's going through. Yep. Doesn't matter if they won one title or four, it's hard. Look at what happened to Dallas in 2011 after they won. Mm-hmm. Right. And so I think that they just managed this as best as they could 
given the contractual situations and the amount of money that those players wanted. Mm-hmm. I, I really do. Yeah. You know. Blake, past memories? Yeah. Uh, I mean, look, the G League stuff is uh, near and dear to me. Um, yeah. Him going down there after starting his first 40 NBA games and early in that rookie season. I mean, we went so quickly from summer league, Dwayne Casey dropping Bo Outlaw comps. Yeah. Um, the first thing oh, I have. Do you remember him blocking KD? Yes. In the first game of preseason. Yes. So this is the KD Warriors. This yeah. is where I was going to go. So I, I remember fond- So um, uh, a big feature on Pascal was like one of the first things I ever wrote for Sportsnet as a freelancer uh, mm-hmm. from Summer League and, and why, you know, they thought he could be more than this. Zero people I talked to for that story thought he was going to be an all star, all NBA no, guy. They were no. all like, yo, he could be more than the 27th pick and more than an energy guy. Yeah. But nobody saw this coming. And then so, you know, to start his rookie season, 40 games in a row or whatever, be overmatched, be guarding KD one night, Mello one night, like trial by fire defensively. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then having to, you know, that really tough and really the first guy we've seen into other guys had gone to the G league, but to go from starting every single game to go down to the G league and have to rebuild yourself that way and take the right attitude about it and and use that to, to use a norm term to motivate your grind and and things like that um, was really special. And like, obviously that, that nine Oh five championship was a lot of fun Mm -hmm. with him and Fred and Bruno and things like that and getting a look at his game developing, but also him as a leader developing um, in those nine Oh five windows. It was very, very cool. And then that being kind of the foundation on which, one of the literally mm-hmm. greatest player development stories in NBA history was yeah. built on and, and kind of getting to be there from the the jump was has been very, very cool. Yeah. Um, l- from G Leaguer to like and New Mexico small State. college. Yeah. New Mexico State, man. Yeah. Las yeah. Cruces, New Mexico. Like yeah. the, like the film you pull on him after it's, the draft. You know, it's 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 out there, man. It's out there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's where it's it is. Through some tumbleweeds and stuff like that. But he's he's yeah. he's yeah, he's done an amazing job, yes. and I and I just two things real quick. It's yeah, interesting. Yeah. We, um, and and probably in the U.S. It kind of Rick Pitino. I'll never forget. Rick was at a game in Utah, and at halftime, I was talking with him. He goes, "Matt, who is that guy? I love that guy. It's his rookie year, Pascal. Oh, because he was kind of his type of guy. You wow. know, like if you watch okay. his Louisville teams or whatever, yeah, yeah. just running up and down and." You know, the energy, the ability to guard, all those different things. That always stuck with me. Yeah. You know, right? Rick Pitino was. And then the other thing, and you specific moment, and I want to say it was in February of that championship year where they come out of a huddle, and you guys probably remember this game. Kawhi was playing, and Nick Nurse dialed up the game-winning uh, shot and play for Pascal Siakam against the Phoenix Suns. Yes, and mm, against Mikel Bridges. Yeah. And he came down, broke it down, and it was that left hand high off the window, and it came in. Mm. And that, to me, was the signal of, hey, you're you're that guy. Yeah. You know, it's like all this work is paying off, right? Mm-hmm. You, I'm going to, yeah, Kawhi's here. Yeah, we got, you know, all that. But I'm giving you the ball. And when he hit that game-winning shot against Phoenix, and now, granted, Phoenix wasn't Phoenix at the time, but this oh, is the NBA. Yeah. This is the NBA, yeah. right? It's hard to win in this league. And he did that to me. And I had conversations with Nick, you know, after that about, you know, the importance of putting the ball in his hands. And if you don't, if he doesn't have that game experience of doing that, right, mm-hmm. we got to see that over the course of that regular season. Boom. He does it. You talked about, you know, game six, right, in that moment. So, yeah. So, uh, Pascal Siakam, you will be missed in Toronto. I understand that it's time to move on. It's difficult to accept these things, but it is. Fifth in all time Raptors games played, fifth in everything, third in rebounding, fifth in assists, fifth in points, won a championship as a second option, two all stars, two all NBAs. Thank you, Pascal. Most improved. Most improved. G League champion. G League champion. One on Hunger Don't Hungary forget that Yeah, don't forget yeah. that Paramount Fine Food Center. McFlurry. Yeah. You know what? Get the McSwirl as, as, as quickly as you can. Because, well, you can. That's... Uh, yeah. Oh, well, Matt Devlin, I appreciate you. We're going to have to take this break. We already yeah. skipped the last but, one. By, yeah, by the way, you. sorry, for, for everyone who's listening, as one, we're, we're going to continue rolling with oh, the yeah, Pascal Siakam sure. trade coverage. Obviously, uh, we'll, we'll be on air until 4 uh, as usual. We've got Mark Stein coming up after the break, yeah. uh, but we got to get a short break. In and, and I would just say this again to reiterate, 
expiring contract, three first rounders. Yeah. Fair enough. Right? Yeah. Hey, thanks for having me. There you go. Well, Matt, you couldn't have timed it better. We're going to take this break. You've been listening to the Raptors show on the Sportsnet Radio Network. Welcome back to the Raptors show on the Sportsnet Radio Network. I'm your host, Wayne Malou. I'm joined by co-host Blake Murphy. We are reacting live to Pascal Siakam getting traded to Indiana for three first-round picks and Bruce Brown and Jordan Nawara. And to help us break this thing down live, man, this, this could not have worked out any better. Mark Stein... Mark Stein, what's going on, man? What's going on? Uh, Pascal Siakam finally gets traded, so we will have to ask you about this for the last time. But, um, yeah, what are you hearing around this situation? And uh, are, are you ultimately surprised that Indiana is the destination they landed with and that uh, the Raptors got the, the, the package primarily consisting of picks rather than prospects? This is what people had been uh, speculating was on Masai's wish list. No, really, I think the talk about Indy has been steady that they were the most determined suitor here. And I think something else that you have to factor in is, you know, they were very heavily involved in the pursuit of OG Ananobi before Toronto mm -hmm. did that deal with the Knicks. So I think these teams have been talking for a while now. And when you really look at Indiana's situation, you know, this is an opportunity for them to get an all-star before he hits free agency to inherit his bird rights. And, you know, let's face it, the Pacers, first of all, they would have had to make a bunch of moves even to create salary cap space in the off season. But are they going to win free agent pursuits in the summertime? I think it's, uh, I think it's fair to question whether they would have been able to do that. And so the chance for them to acquire a player of Pascal's caliber at this point. I mean, I think you you see by what they gave up how motivated they were. And, of course, they were able to do it without giving up Maturin or Jarris Walker, which they desperately did not want to do. So still a high price that they surrendered to make this trade happen. Mm. But I, I, I really think it has been looking like Indiana was going to be the team now for – for a while yeah Indy keeping their prospects I mean one it, it keeps if you're looking long term at how do you sustain a winner part of that is finding inexpensive and then those next waves of talents you also have those pieces available if you need to make a trade down the line uh, the Raptors upside thing here is uh, I, I can confirm from through the break by the way that the 2026 pick from the Pacers is only top four protected so if the Pacers were to find some bad luck or bottom out or something like that um, you know it's not fully lottery protected I don't think they're going to be bad by 2026. I think they're going to be uh, just fine. Um, but that's an element of this as well. So, um, Mark, that that's kind of the, I guess the the larger picture question here is the value the Raptors got today versus the value they maybe could have gotten on Pascal Siakam had they made this decision earlier. I, I know some of this is kind of backward looking in a way that, isn't helpful, but I would like to do it for a moment anyway. Um, when you see the return here, Bruce Brown, some salary filler and three firsts that don't project to be great firsts, but they're first nonetheless. Do you think the Raptors missed the window this past off season to potentially get more back for Pascal Siakam at a time when um, teams would have been able to at least discuss uh, extensions with him? Probably not the answer you guys are going to want, but I think the true answer is, it's going to require some more reporting. And okay. now that this trade has gone through, I think there's maybe a better chance to get a clearer picture of exactly what they could have done in the off season, because there, it was so murky. I mean, I just remember being in Vegas and there was tons of talk about Siakam's future then, but to even get a clear handle on what the best the Raptors could have done in a trade, then it was, you know, not possible, or I, you know, I would have already reported it myself if I if I had it completely nailed. So now that this has gone through and is done, maybe that clarity will emerge. Um, but you know, yeah, I think I think what we can say is, you know, the Raptors obviously did not trade Fred VanVleet before last season's trade deadline. And losing him for nothing, even though based on everything I've heard, you know, I don't feel like the Raptors have tons of 
regret about that situation. I mean, the consistent messaging has been that, you know, what was available at the time for Fred was not knock your socks off stuff. And so that kind of led them to roll the dice and see if they could figure something out in free agency. And obviously they did not. But the fact that, you know, we can talk about those semantics all day long. The fact that they didn't manage to get any return for Fred Van Vliet after it had happened previously in in free agency with other members from the championship team. And obviously when, when Kyle Lowry left, it was a very minimal return. I think all that does factor in. And so in this case, the Raptors have avoided that worst case scenario. And yeah, they're not the greatest first round picks in the world, but three first round picks, it is, a decent haul and, you know, who knows, can they package those into, can they turn those picks into something else? I mean, it does increase their optionality. So um, although the truth is, honestly, I feel like I should be asking you guys the questions because you're more emotionally invested hmm. well, in the Raptors I, than me. I'm not going to lie to you. you guys, how do you guys feel? Mark, I'm, I'm a little hot. I feel like we just got 50 cents on the dollar. And I understand that it's a difficult market. There were so many factors involved. Was Pascal going to re-sign with the team that he was going to? Uh, was, you know, um, you know, again, just uh, how many teams exactly were in on the, the trade talks? Because it seemed like Sacramento dropped out. Uh, you would know much better about if Dallas was actually truly, truly in this. Uh, well, look, look, I, mean, I mean, on those on those two teams, I think it's clear that I think they did better if Sacramento is not putting Keegan Murray in the deal. And obviously Sacramento was adamant that they were never putting yes. Keegan Murray in the deal. I think you would probably be half, have to be happier with the return you got from the Pacers. And, you know, I've been reporting since January 1st that the Mavericks interest in Siakam has been overstated and yeah. I'm not backing off that. Like they admire him as a player. They like him as a player, but I don't think the Mavericks were prepared to max him had they traded for him. Mm -hmm. And the Mavs don't have three first round picks. The Mavs have one. There so, you go. I mean, but the, what again, what I can't sit here, you know, I can't completely allay your concerns because I can tell you exactly what they could have gotten in August had they traded him. Yeah. You know, that's, I think that's the variable we need to evaluate this a little better. Exactly. Because I, I do feel like the Raptors had multiple chances to, to quote unquote get off the bus. You know, and I feel like this was definitely the last time you really could have realistically done it because I don't think a sign and trade even gets you as much as this currently gets you. But you do have to wonder what kind of deals were offered around the time of the draft, what time of deals were offered last year at the trade deadline when the Raptors were six games under 500 and decided to add Yaka Proto in an attempt to try to compete and win, which obviously did not work out uh, in, 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 the, in the play in tournament, but still. When you look back at it, it's just like you ultimately did give up a player that you drafted, developed, turned into an all-star, re-signed. You turned down the chances to extend him, which could have possibly gotten you more in the deal. Who knows? Maybe or maybe not. That's also hard to say. Seems like the new second apron has really made it difficult to trade any expensive contracts. Just look at Zach Levine right now. There's like no market. Uh, at, at least that's what you know. everyone's reporting. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that maybe a little bit later. But... Um, yeah, it's just, it's a little underwhelming because again, you can't even guarantee that there's going to be a lottery pick amongst the three that return for Pascal Siaka. But again, like you wouldn't really know this until you do more digging and until you really get the truth out of what was offered on the table, what the Raptors ultimately passed up because yeah, as it stands right now, they pivot. Everyone understands why they would pivot. Clearly this is going to be Scotty's team moving forward. Masai even said in a team released team produced team edited clip of open gym that uh after receiving Emmanuel quickly he called him and he said to him it's going to be you and Scotty and it's going to be a fresh start here like I don't think you could actually make it as more transparent as you would with that considering that again it's a team produced product to say that on record I understand moving on I, I just I just wonder really did the Raptors get full full value that they could have possibly done so within this two year period that they've had Pascal, but I'm curious to hear how your thoughts are of Pascal's fit in Indiana. Do you think he's going to be amenable to re-signing there? And also just what Indiana's next moves are because buddy healed has been the option that's been thrown into a lot of these trades. 
And, you know, there might still be a resolution there potentially because I, I don't know if Indiana's done with just making this one trade. Uh, Mark, I know that's a long-winded question, but what are your thoughts on the Indiana side of this? No, I mean, I first of all, love the passion. Second of all, I wish I had seen that. I never saw that clip you're referencing about. I'll send Weaver. you the clip. I'll send you the clip. Yeah. Yeah. I wish I, yeah, I'm going to have to, uh, I'm going to have to check that out. I did not see that. I mean, honestly, when they went after Ananobi first, Mm-hmm. You know, there has been some talk about the Pacers having Andrew Wiggins' interest. And and so, you know, I, I did I, – I was curious if they were looking for more of a 3-4. But, look, I think, I think they look at this like – and I was told – it's funny. I was – I think earlier this week, it must have been Tuesday, that I, I checked with someone and asked, can the Pacers pull this off? without including Matherin or Walker. And they were like, that's obviously their goal. They really hope so. But they really liked the Occam. And that was the strongest I had ever heard it to this point. So when we get the deal today finally getting completed, it doesn't surprise me now. So by all accounts, the Pacers really did want to get this done and bring in an all-star front court player which they clearly need. And look, they don't have Halliburton now, but Halliburton is so good. And I mean, just to be like the face of your franchise, to build a team around him, it's hard. I mean, I don't know who wouldn't be a good fit playing with him. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, that it's, I, 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 and I do think you, I do think you make a wise point there. They're not necessarily done either. They still have, pieces to go out and make subsequent moves. So the Pacers are definitely a team on the rise. And, you know, I, I do think it will, I, I, I do think the Occam and, and Halliburton are going to click. Yeah. I think on, on the court, it's going to be uh, pretty tremendous. He's going to have, Siakam's going to have a lot of space to operate within. And you're right. Anyone could play with Halliburton. Will, Will was telling me about his pickup game last night and all the threes he was draining. You imagine Will Lou getting passes <laughs> okay. from Tyrese Halliburton. Um, it would make a difference, buddy. I'm, I'm, I'm still, I'm still the one shooting. <laughs> yeah. Where's it? Where's that footage? That's a good question, Mark. Uh, um, on, on the Raptors. So look, the Pacers might not be done. The Raptors might not be done either. OG and Pascal are obviously the headline items. Um, and, and the, you know, it's not even the next tier down. It's probably the next tier down after that. Those type of things really don't tend to happen until the deadline. Although I said that about Pascal style deals as well. Um, do you imagine the Raptors are, are going to continue down this path of, of basically anything that's not Scotty quickly or um, RJ Barrett is, Hey, you can give us a call on it, including potentially Bruce Brown. Yeah. Nobody, nobody's turning down calls at this time of year. And that is, you know, that's one of the funny things that we, you know, trade season, people in my business love to say that trade season starts December 15th. And I just, there's been a lot of discussion like, hey, you know, well, we, uh, trades don't really happen until closer to the deadline. But we've already seen, what, four trades in the first month plus since December 15th. So, I mean, not only has there been a lot of early action, but, you know, we still have a good Three, three weeks and a day to go. So why not? I mean, you you know, you're not going to, again, you're not going to turn the phone off. And, you know, Bruce Brown does have a tradable contract if he's, you know, you can't aggregate him, but as a solo entity. Because mm-hmm. um, you would imagine, I mean, I, I don't know that, I don't know how competitive Toronto wants to be right now with a top six protected pick. Like you got to, you got to, yeah. they got to keep, this draft is not the strongest. You cannot lose that pick. And you're not, you can't really do worse than six, given how bad the NBA's top five is right now. So, yeah, sorry, how bad the NBA, how bad the NBA's bottom five is right now. It is, it is quite competitive uh, at the bottom of the standings. Well, I mean, you, you do see the, the I, I suppose these are the first two big dominoes to fall because OG two weeks ago and now Pascal is gone. Um, for the rest of the league, I mean. Who do you think the next big domino is going to be? There's a lot of talk about DeJounte Murray, for example. Yeah, I think he is the most obvious candidate. He's just easier to trade than Zach Levine. I mean, the reality is the the Bulls just have not been able to create a market for Zach Levine because it's just such a big contract that you have to take on. And, that, and again, that's, you know, you just compare 
the Pacers to, let's say, the Mavs or the Kings. You know, the, Ma- the Mavs and the Kings both have two max players in place. So if you're going to add that third guy and you're going to max him, I mean, you're giving away so many avenues to make moves in the future because you're limited in trades, you're limited, your draft optionality is limited, you can't sign players on the on the buyout market once you go into that second apron. It is so devastating. Whereas DeJounte Murray is in that contract range now, you know, his deal, four years, $114 million, it's a much easier deal to take on. And, you know, he's he's a bargain at that price. So that, to me, does, you know, I can't sit here and tell you I know exactly where DeJounte Murray is going to land, but DeJounte Murray getting traded, far a more likely scenario than Zach Levine at this point. Yeah. All right. Well, um, that's, it's, it's very interesting. It's very interesting right now. Um, Stein, we, we might have to let you go. So, we, so, you, so, so, so you are, is it fair to say that you're mad? I just think that, like, over the last two years, you had multiple chances to potentially get more value out of Pascal Siakam, and I don't believe that these three specific first-round picks were the best that you could have done value-wise. That's all I'm thinking about. That and also I will miss Pascal because, you know, he's a championship piece, but I could put aside the feelings for that. I just think that there was a different time and a different opportunity that this could have been done. And I get that they're in this moment right here and right now, and this is probably the best deal available on the table. But still, it does feel like, ah, man, we, we have given up an all-NBA player in his prime. And, uh, yeah. But in any case, uh, Mark, we actually have to let you go. Uh, we have someone from Pascal's side uh, joining us on the line, and, and we're going to have to shift. So I appreciate you, Mark, and we'll call you next week. Sounds good, guys. Be good. Thank you. Mark Stein, Substack. Yeah, there's very few instances that we would drop Mark Stein. Uh, but in this case, we have joining us on the line Todd Ramasar, founder and CEO of Life Sports Agencies, Pascal Siakam's agent. Uh, you know, Todd, obviously, Pascal has just been moved. Uh, can you take us through the uh, process in which, you know, Masai and Bobby, the Raptors front office, kept you guys informed of uh, Pascal being in these discussions? Because clearly... Uh, there's been a lot of discussions around Pascal Siakam. Yeah, so guys, uh, great to join you guys. And, and obviously, it's uh, it's been a busy morning, at least, or, or afternoon here on the West Coast. But as far as uh, as far as the deal is uh, concerned, you know, I give uh, Masai and, and Bobby credit for their communication throughout the process. That kind of led us to the point of uh, today in terms of Pascal being moved to uh, the Pacers. So I, I know, Todd, there is always, you know, a lot of reporting, accurate or otherwise, uh, about, hey, this team talked to this camp. There's this level of openness to future things and things like that. Uh, putting that aside, your initial reaction to this being Indiana and Pascal's level of uh, excitement to join that Pacers program? Well, I, I could speak for me. I know it, it's a bit bittersweet because the time with the Raptors, you know, Pascal was drafted there. He's won a championship. He's had uh, so many relationships, friendships built there. So it's not just all excitement and uh, elation just going from the Raptors organization to the Pacers. But in terms of that being where, you know, we're at now at this point of Pascal being in a Pacers uniform, you know, they have a young budding superstar in Tyrese. You know, they have uh, Miles Turner that's been there for some time, and they have a Hall of Fame coach in addition to some of their other young talent there. And it's a, um, a first-class organization in terms of front office to ownership. You know, there is a lot of that organization. And really, when you look at their style of play and – potentially what's been missing for a team that's having a tremendous amount of success in the Eastern conference and the league as a whole, Pascal fits or complements their roster. I think as best as uh, any player that they could add to their roster right now. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, you have the floor spacing five uh, who can also protect the rim and miles Turner they have a really good distributor, a really nice style of play under Rick Carlisle. And you could definitely see Pascal thriving um, in Indiana. Of course, we'll see what happens 
uh, once he joins the team. But, you know, I, I certainly see, from my opinion, a long-term fit there. From the Toronto perspective with Pascal, um, there's been so much reporting around Pascal, you know, wanting to continue the relationship here in Toronto, wanting to sign extensions and things of that nature. Uh, I would just like to ask you in this opportunity, were there extension talks that uh, you guys were able to have with Bobby Masai and the timeline of those talks, maybe not necessarily the details unless you would like to share those as well, of Pascal potentially extending with Toronto in the last two, three years? Yeah, there was conversations that were had uh, with the organization and front office but obviously we're here now where, you know, there's a parting of ways. So I would, I would probably just, I, I think that speaks for itself. Um, and I don't, you know, that's the nature of this NBA, you know, and there, I think there was a, a lot of changes, you know, with the roster to the coaching staff. Um, and I don't, I don't say that disparaging. It's just a lot of change. There's a lot of young pieces and, Darko was great, and I think Pascal was, you know, being the veteran on that team and, and one of the last pieces with Boucher from the championship after OG's trade. It was just, I think, a turning of the next chapter on, on both sides. Um, so in terms of, uh, you know, Pascal now in Indiana on, on that side, you, you spoke about uh, the fit as well. Um has there been any communication or what's the, what's the process been like? Because obviously it's only been like about an hour since the deal has been in made. What are your responsibilities now as the agent to, to help him cope with this? Cause this is the first time he's gone through a trade in his career. Yeah. It's just, you know, being proactive about some of the questions uh, that, you know, Pascal may have in terms of timing of, you know, flights and, you know, the, the Pacers are on the road, right. They, uh, Pascal still has to take his physical uh, for the trade to officially go through, and that needs to be approved on both sides. But um, it's really just being proactive. Obviously, this is not the first time I've gone through a trade with with a client, so it's taking that experience and really sharing it with the client so that, you know, you can kind of ease their transition to something new. A lot of times trades happen in the off-season, and it's a lot more seamless of a transition from one team to the next. But when you're in the middle of the season and uh, the expectation is to join that team, learn a new offense, uh, learn new personnel, learn a new city, you know, find housing and a number of other things uh, that um, are going to come up. It's just helping that transit, helping the client through that transition as best as possible. So their focus in this case for Pascal is going to be on the court and helping his new team win. Of course, of course. And and I'm sure there's going to be some familiarity from you guys too. Obviously, um, you guys also have Andrew Nemhard, who, who's been with the Pacers. Yeah. And, you know, um, yeah, uh, it would be great to see both your clients in the, in the same city as well. Uh, shifting back to Pascal and just Toronto, because, you know, again, this is all happening and, you know, everything's happening on the fly here. Uh, I, I wanted to ask you from, you know, obviously representing Pascal and, and knowing from a long time, do you think this news caught him by surprise and, just in general, his, his his affection for the city of Toronto, having spent so much time here. Yeah, it's it's always well, it's always a surprise, like right. And what I mean by that is, obviously, there's been a, a lot of news, a lot of speculation, a lot of conversation. So, the trade itself is not a surprise, but always the timing and when it actually happens is a surprise because it's real. Mm -hmm. Once it happens, it becomes real, opposed to you know, just being in the news cycle. So, you know, like I said, I, as I described it earlier, it's, it is bittersweet, you know, because, you know, it's it's departing an organization where there's so many great memories and there's a championship. And, you know, and it's not just departing an organization. You're departing a city. You're departing a country that you've grown to love, you know, what would have been the last eight years or, or eight seasons. And, um you know, it's a new chapter, you know, so that's, uh, you know, again, I don't want to speak for Pascal, but kind of get, you know, knowing him, knowing the conversations, uh, and even, and I could tell you even personally going through that experience all those years, it's like I said, it's a, it's a bit bittersweet, no doubt. but there's a lot to look forward to. And I, and I have all the confidence in the world in Pascal and, 
his work ethic, his professionalism, uh, because it has not been easy uh, to still show up and represent the Raptors organization with all this news swirling and being a professional and showing up for your teammates, your coaches, the fans, and everyone else. So uh, that's that's what's exciting, at least moving forward for him. Yeah, you, and I see. Right. You. I mean, you mentioned it's not easy because even just us on the show sometimes, we're like every single day, there's a new rumor, we talk about it, and people almost reach a point of fatigue about, you know what, like when is this thing going to happen? But I think it's got to be even more frustrating for the player because, you know, you have to stay professional. You have to sort of still give your best effort. And I still feel like he did that to the very end of his time in Toronto. Just two things to wrap up because we are obviously going to miss Pascal a lot in Toronto. Just wanted to ask you if you had any memory of Pascal and his first workout in Toronto or just how he got to Toronto in the first place uh, that you would like to share. Buffalo workout. Secret internationals only Buffalo workout is yeah. what I remember. You guys already know you know that workout, so I don't I don't know if I have to shed much light, but what you guys know and what I know is is real. Like that, mm -hmm. Pascal was licking his chops in that, uh, as they say, going into that workout. So yeah, kind of you know I I think when people see Pascal or to get to know him, he's like he's so personable and and likable, but there's this competitive spirit about him, mm -hmm. this fire that. You know, um, I think in situations like that, um, that just come out of them. And it was, uh, you know, it's what led the Raptors to, to take him there in the first round when he was relatively an unknown player, you know, coming out of New Mexico State. So, yeah, that's, that's how it came to be, Will, in terms of that. But, you know, you, you, players that go through workouts like that and what in feedback you get from the organization, especially with, you know, Masai and, and Patrick Engelbright and some of the other Raptors front office being aware of uh, Pascal from Basketball Without Borders, you know, to see his growth and, and see him come in and do what he did in that workout, I think uh, I think for them it was an easy decision who they had to go with. Yeah. And then the rest is history after that. The rest is really history, but, of course, we got to ask you about the most important part of that history, championship. Raptors in 2019, Pascal being the second leading scorer of that whole entire run. Um, do you have a memory of that championship run with Pascal that, that really made you feel, I don't know, that you look back fondly on? I, I know you've got tons of players and, and, and you know, you will continue to represent lots of players and Pascal's going to continue to make great memories. But is there one that stands out to you um, about Pascal in that championship run that you would like to share? Guys, there's so many. I mean, there's so many, and there's so many kind of off the record, sort of speak memories, all positive mm -hmm. and good. But there was something magical about that season that was even before the playoffs started. And I mean, like this time of year, of that season, something that stands out to me, and I was, I was actually talking to Pascal about it. It's just interesting, um, you know, what the future may bring when you're, you're intentional about it and, and, uh, and, and you have momentum behind you. We were actually in the NBA office and I actually had filmed it. Pascal had a, uh, had a meeting with uh, the league office about just his initiatives as a young player that. Hello guys. You there? Yeah, we're still here. Yep. Okay. I'm sorry. Just his initiatives. Um, you know, for Africa and, and, and initiatives in Canada from a philanthropic standpoint. And we wrapped up the meeting and the Larry O'Brien trophy is just right there, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I'll never forget, Pascal picked it up oh. and we were talking about winning a championship and I have it on film and he's rubbing the trophy and holding it and everything. And then literally a few months later, you know, and, you know, the, the Raptors win the championship. Mm -hmm. um, so that's something leading into the playoffs and leading into that. That was just magical about that season. But the one memory or one play uh, being there in, uh, in the Bay was, uh, I think it was game six, was Pascal's teardrop, you know, that floater over Draymond yep. that uh, sealed, literally sealed the series in, in the championship. I would say that was the best memory um, that I take away from that, uh, from that, that playoff run. For Pascal.
Yeah, that's got to be so incredibly rewarding too because I, I don't know when you met Pascal, but it was probably as a teenager, probably as somebody who was really young, had no real life experience, no NBA basketball experience, and to see him grow in a short time to get to that point and then eventually hit other highs like All-Star and All-NBA, uh, you know, sign a max contract, most improved player. It, it's got to be the best part about doing this job. So, Todd, I appreciate you. I know you're going to be a really, really busy person today. A lot of people are going to call you. Pascal's going to call you. The Pacers are here on Valentine's yeah. Day. Uh, oh, we'll Pascal will be oh, back. Man. I assume we're going to see you, uh, for, you know, a little post-breakup <laughs> Valentine's Day special yeah, here in Toronto. You know what, guys? It's not a, at least for me, it's not a breakup. Like, <laughs> I'm, I tell you, I'm going to miss visiting Canada as frequent, uh, frequent as I have. But it gives me a good excuse to come back up there on Valentine's Day. So I hope to see you guys there. But I appreciate you guys for having me on and – I appreciate you guys uh, being great to my guy throughout the years. Yeah, I was going to say, last thing, just tell, I mean, whatever, just tell it from us that the Raptors, the Raptors fan base, recognize, appreciate, and thank Pascal for what he did for the franchise. Yeah, that guy, that guy got me a Raptors 905 championship ring, so. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, we didn't even remember that, there too. Go. There you go. Todd? Oh, I right, love it. Thanks, thank guys. You. Thank you. Have a good Yep. Bye. That was Todd Ramasar. Pascal Siakam's agent. Founder and CEO, Life Sports Agency. Yeah. yeah. That's cool. This is... Uh, what kind of, look at us having pull. Like, Pascal gets traded and we got his agent on the line in an hour from now. Yeah. Now, let's take a moment to recognize the producers who I made that I thought you happen. were going to recognize yourself. No, no Alex has moved on. Don't worry, don't worry. <laughs> that, the the self-promotion is going to be less. Uh, no, but seriously, let's take a time to shout out Mark Boffo, um, Daniele, for making this thing happen. Because, like, those two... what Their they names did, are. Their names are. But seriously, those two working in a live kind of uh, setup to even come up with the idea to make it happen, to get Todd connected, to get his thoughts and comments. Uh, and just on a day like this in general, dude, everything's thrown into flux. Respect, you know, we, we were going to have Amy Otterbird on the show to talk about the heat game. We're going to have Michael Grange after the break instead. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And yeah, that stuff doesn't happen as, as much as we might look at our phones, trying to report details and stuff like that. We can't also live book a yeah. show. It doesn't happen without the producers. What we can do before the break and before we talk to Michael Grange though, is uh, you have a Jersey to give away. That's right. That's what everyone's here for right now. Not, not, not to a Pascal Siakam Raptors. Just, oh, no, <laughs> no, don't worry. Uh, no, don't it's worry. not. Don't worry. We need, yeah. Uh, the NBA All-Star game is a month away and you have the chance to vote your favorite Raptors like Scotty Barnes into the game in Indianapolis. I guess we're not sending Pascal to Indianapolis no more. He's already there. Uh, vote today. And remember that on Friday, January 19th, your vote counts three times. Make sure you head to NBA.com or the NBA app to cast your vote. Celebrate All-Star voting. We're giving away a signed scotty barnes jersey to enter for your chance to win text today's code word all star two words no dash all star to five nine five ninety again today's code word is all star texas into five ninety five ninety right now for enter your chance to win this scotty barnes signed jersey okay we're gonna take our last break i've been your host willow you've been listening to the raptor show on the sports radio network Welcome back to the Raptors show on the Sportsnet Radio Network. I'm your host, Wayne Malou, joined by Blake Murphy, co-host, and we are joined by Michael Grange of Sportsnet. Man, we're going to hit every single angle possible. All right, we got every insider. We're going to get his agent on the line, and now we're going to get Michael Grange on the line yeah. as well. T tomorrow, by the way, we'll get the Pacers side of this as well. We'll, we'll, we'll talk to Caitlin Cooper, and we'll see about the fit there and the yeah. price they gave up. But, yeah, not today. We'll talk to Grange. Grange, what's going on? You all right? <laughs> not much, you know, just... Uh... Just getting ready to go to the game, see what's going on. Yeah, not much happening at this game. You know, Kyle's back, you know. Let's be, that'll be nice. <laughs> Kyle who? Uh, yeah, exactly. Got to tell you, my pregame TV hit is uh, I, I'm going to have to rewrite oh, my notes on oh, the word. on the TTC in because I, I don't think we're going to talk about, <gasps> uh, at, at least not as much about, hey, Javon Freeman Liberty's up from the 905. Oh, I, I'm not man. sure that's super relevant today was, anymore. Was that ever super relevant? No offense to Javon Freeman you, you guys said the same thing about Jonte Porter, and then he's starting against Al Horford for 18 yeah. minutes. Yeah, you're right. Um, you're right. Uh, Grange, uh, okay, so you, uh, an extremely good piece and an extremely well-timed piece that you had go up today uh, about how the Raptors and Pascal Siakam got to this point. So I guess before getting into the specific questions we have for you, at a high level, how do you feel about how this has played out and where it ultimately led the Raptors in terms of a return for Siakam? Yeah, I think, um, you know, I think there was an impasse that, that kind of hit, uh, heading into training camp last year. And, 
you know, the Raptors offered Pascal uh, an extension at that time. It was three years, $125 million, which is based on 30% of the cap, which is the most they could offer him in that time. And, and you know, Pascal kind of did the bet on himself thing, as you might expect, and, and wanted to try and push to the All-NBA and get the, you know, be eligible for the 35% Supermax. And, and at that time, you know, it was told me and, and kind of, I think, made clear – to Pascal that, that, you know, the Raptors didn't want to go to a 35% super max, even if he did, for example, earn second or third term NDA and, 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 um, and qualify for it. Like it wasn't going to be an automatic. If you do this, you'll get this. Uh, the message was, you know, this is where we, you know, we see you, we value you. And, you know, I think there was an exception if, look, if you guys, you're, you're in the top five of the MVP conversation and, uh, you know, this team's in the conference finals. Well, okay. I mean, obviously that's a bit different, but, um, <clears throat> you know, and if you look back, that was, you know, Pascal saying you want to be a top five player in the league and I'm not saying one was connected to the other, but, but, um, you know, I think it was at that point that, that the two sides diverged and, um, you know, we all know what happened following, you know, through the season last year and then, trade discussions and you know, the off season kind of tension, so to speak. And I think if you're going to sort of draw a line, it would be that, you know, they, you know, the Raptors could never, you know, they just didn't want to pay that level of value for Siakam. And I think that became a kind of a, a point of contention. And, um, and I would say, you know, based on the, you know, and, and in the midst of all of this, as you guys all know, but that, you know, the whole NBA marketplace kind of shifted and cooled, right? With the new CBA and the introduction of the second, second apron and all those kinds of factors, um, you know, it became really prohibitive to pay, you know, you had to be very careful about what you were going to play players and who. And that, I think, in turn affected the trade market in terms of, you know, the, the you know, what you could drum up in terms of value. And then you had the other factors about Pascal pending, being a pending free agent. So the whole thing leads to, you know, the Raptors parting ways with really a quintessential player in the fabric of this franchise. I mean, there's no arguing about that, either symbolically or literally. And, um, you know, for, you know, I, you know, like it's a pretty modest return, right? Like who knows what these pecs end up in. And we all call it three years from now, could look back, oh, wow, you know, weren't the Raptors lucky to have four picks in the top 31 of 2024 because look what happened. But, mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think if we were all discussing this, uh, you know, this would be kind of at the low end of what anyone would have uh, hoped for. Certainly it's a bit of an op- low end, um, the three picks. I don't know, Grange. I'm sorry. I've said this like five times already <laughs> on this program. That's what but... a trade reaction program is, Well, Ah, three, three non-lottery picks. Um, yeah, I, I, I guess, I, you know, listen, you, 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 you let it get to this point, and I think you end up running short for the reasons that you mentioned. But I, I think, you know, what's been interesting about this particular trade um, for me is just how much talk about, you know, like, you know, was, was Pascal done dirty in this kind of, in this situation? Not not saying that like it is wrong to move on. Absolutely. It's, it's fine to move on. It's right to move on. The front office made that difficult decision. They move on. Yeah. It's also sad that you lose a championship piece, but again, time moves on. That's always going to happen eventually. But in the course of this process, you, you, there are a lot of reporting and then a lot of it, you know, uh, the details that you were able to bring to light that kind of does suggest that Pascal might not have been done, like, completely right by this whole process. I mean, it might just all be watered in the bridge long term. I'm sure everyone's going to hug it out. It's all good. Nothing's going to be worse than what happened to DeMar DeRozan. But Grinch, when I when I bring this up, what, what what's kind of up to mind for you? Or do you even agree with this? Or maybe it's just me being inexperienced and being like, hey, well, this is just how the NBA works. <laughs> um, you know, probably a little of column A, a little of column B. I okay. mean, it's a totally fair question. I think, um, you know, I, I think it's interesting. You mentioned Mark Rosen where, you know, I think it was kind of a traumatic experience for the franchise, for Masai Jury in particular, to kind of go through that and trade a guy who was meant so much uh, to him and to so many people here and be uh, I guess, accused or suggested that, that he kind of, uh, was didn't he wasn't up front how how all that went I mean I, I've written about it and shown at the time that that I don't think that's a fair and completely fair interpretation but it was a tough thing to go through and and I think you know you contrast to this now and um, 
you know, it's almost been the opposite, like where, you know, he's, I think Siakam has been kept so far at arm's length. Like the, the two men have barely spoken. I mean, they had a meeting in, uh, in California last week. Um, and, and I think if there's two things, I think, you know, with the benefit of 2020 hindsight, um, I think could have done differently. I think once, you know, the Raptors kind of concluded that they didn't want to go beyond a 30%, um, you know, the 30% max, that three-year extension they offered. And I'm, and I'm under, under the impression, that, you know, there were some talks around about it again this year as well. Um, you know, I think they probably should have just pulled the Band-Aid off and they should have made this movie either last year at the trade deadline mm-hmm. or last summer. And at least in that context, you would have, wouldn't have dragged this on as long as it's gone. Um, whatever return you did get, we wouldn't be sitting here going, well, it's because you waited too long. <laughs> right. So, um, and, um, and you could just kind of move this whole process along more quickly. I think, you know, to your point was, you know, was there, was this done inappropriately or anything like that? I mean, you know, the Raptors are allowed to assert what they believe is a value for the player. Like, and yeah. you know, when we're talking 30 to 35%, you know, four years or five years, like these are massive amounts of money. And as we talked about off the top, you know, if you make a mistake on this, some of these deals, you can really hamstring yourself. And so I don't have any objection to them uh, making that decision. I also don't have any objection to, the, to Pascal Siakam and his people saying, screw it. We want to go for 35% because this is our chance to cash in. And we've, this is everything we've ever worked for. Um, you know, but, but the fact that there was a divide there didn't mean there had to be any kind of breakdown. I mean, that's, you know, I, I, you know, that's the, something I'm not a hundred percent privy to, but I don't think that there was, you know, there was a ton of communication back and forth between the sides as this thing went along. And I, I do think at times through this, that, that it really bothered, uh, you know, Siakam and, and the people around him that that's how it did go down. Um, you know, but in the end, right. It is a business and it's like, it's, it's very, it sounds really trite and, you know, offhanded or whatever, but it is what the money's for. Like it's, it's, you know, there's so many things that go on in pro sports that are brutal and, you know, in our own private lives would find maybe even traumatizing. Um, but you know, that is what the compensation is about. And so, you know, you, 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 and Pascal, when last time we spoke to him at any length back in Detroit was after OG been traded and the rest had been traded and, you know, he, he was very upfront with that. It's like, you know, this is, this is the business. And so he's not naive in that respect, but it's just, I hope I would say, I would hope that whatever number of years from now, all this stuff is under the bridge because what Pascal Siakam has uh, accomplished here as a player and what uh, the Raptors, the platform the Raptors were able to give him is a very, very special thing. Like it's, it's going to be a long time before we see another guy pick 27th overall reach the high T has. And uh, if ever, and so, uh, you know, I think I think that's really ultimately where I hope this all gets to. So you're saying that they're not going to get a player as good as Pascal Siakam with all of these late firsts they picked up in the trade? <laughs> well, you you never, that's how like, they salvage the situation, yeah. you know? That's how they salvage you, you never say never, you know? Like, no, I mean, we it, all know how the draft goes. Yeah, but, and, and look, uh, like, you, you tweeted as much more, earlier. Like, you, you get a Jokic in the second round. You get a Pascal in the 27th if you find and develop him. Uh, the Raptors won the title without a lottery pick. But, mm-hmm. Grange, I, I do wonder... What do you make? And the answer to this might just be, well, things change. But a year ago, we were hearing that they were comfortable giving up a first round pick and a couple seconds for Jakob Pertl because they thought they could win now. And yeah, we don't really care to be a part of that draft. And now they have, if they continue to tumble down the standings because they're even worse today than they were this morning, now potentially four picks in the top 32 of a draft that they had kind of just traded out of willingly. What do you, and look, Draft picks are draft picks, even in a bad draft. Bad drafts produce good players. I, I don't want to throw it out entirely, but that change in perspective on the draft in general and this particular draft, um, does that surprise you a, a little bit at all? That it's a it's a pretty big one eighty from this time last year. Um, yeah, hundred <laughs> percent. Like like that's you know, uh, I have a lot of respect for this this organization, this front office. They've done incredible things. Um, and you know, I, I, so, you know, I, I'm not in the business of slamming people, you know, like, it's just, it's just like, this is a tough business, what they're in. But, um, I think it's pretty clear to me, at least 
that they, you know, there's been two pretty significant miscalculations. I think the quality of the team that won 48 games uh, in Scotty Barnes' rookie season, I think they overestimated that. And I think that led them to uh, a few decisions that I'm sure they would take back if they could. Um, and then the finish that they were able to to pull together with Jakob Pertl as a starter, or whatever they were, 15 and nine or something like that, at the end of last year, against in retrospect some really weak competition. Um, you know, I think that that sort of again, you know, they kind of overestimated where they really were as a team and as an organization. And had they been you know, so to that point, like they're trading out of a draft. They think it's weak. They don't think they'll be anywhere near the lottery. So who cares? Um, and by the way, we're on our way. We're not going to be anywhere near the lottery next year either. So we're just we're really just trading two second round picks here for a starting center. That's a pretty good deal. Um, well, it turns out that's not how it turned out. And you know, at some point, like there's a lot of variables in play, but you do have to be accountable for. Um, you know, the judgments you're making. And, and I would argue that, you know, to go from, you know, trading very willingly out of a draft with a lot of, you know, assurances that there's no need to be in the draft anyway. And some of these assurances were delivered to me even weeks ago. <laughs> you know, like, it's not like all of a sudden they, there's been a whole influx of talent that's changed the picture um, to all of a sudden being all over this draft and doing it now at a time when you're, you know, you're, you know, the stated purpose when they made the OG trade was like, we don't want to waste any years of Scotty Barnes, right? Like we don't want to be rebuilding. We want to be, you know, kind of rebounding. And, um, you know, it, it's hard to put all those things together in a nice linear line here. And, you know, so, yeah, I, I think it's a, it's a 180. It's, it's confusing. Um, and, you know, it doesn't mean good things can't come of it, but it's, uh, you know, the, the, I think what we would all agree on is, the chosen path has never been very evident. And, um, you know, and so that's where things get a bit confusing. There you go. Grange, we'll see you down at the arena. I'm sure you'll be a busy man like all of us. Um, I appreciate you taking the time. Okay. Thanks for having me on, guys. All right. Michael Grange of Sportsnet. Uh, make sure you check out all his writing. He'll have something up uh, shortly on the trade, I would imagine. Uh, time now for Between Lines, brought to you by Bet Rivers. Take a chance. The Raptors uh, were two-point underdogs. That has moved to four-point underdogs. I would imagine that will continue moving yeah, yeah, because yeah, Pascal say. Siakam won't play. The guys they traded for won't be here. Uh, Gary Trent and Grady Dick are still questionable. Jakob Pertl, Otto Porter still out. On right. the Heat side, Jaime Hawkes Jr., Kevin Love, Drew Smith, uh, all out will. Yeah, I'm picking the Heat. Uh, <laughs> and I'm also picking uh, a chance to try to talk to Kyle Lowry about this because he'll be a very busy man. But I had some good quotes pregame, which you can uh, check yeah. out. Uh, Josh Lewinberg ha had those posted, and yeah. we'll get a chance pre or post, hopefully. I don't see how you don't pick the Heat on this in this instance, because, especially because Jimmy Butler's back. But anyway, that was yeah. Between the Lines, brought to you by Brett Rivers. You know, on the last thing, and you just pointed to it, I think the last comment for Pascal and his career here in Toronto, um, I think Kyle Lowry said it best. Kyle said today, I shoot around. Pascal's one of the ultimate professional athletes there is. I think he's going to continue to do his job at a high level no matter what. I don't have a vice for him, but I know he's going to go out there and play his game and control what he can control. Pascal, my beloved one, is one of the most coveted players in this league. He's one of the most talented players in this league. And whatever happens with him, he will be successful. I'm always going to love and support him and be happy for him no matter what. I think he honestly, Kyle Lowry, said those words about Pascal. I think he said that on behalf of the whole Raptor fan base. That's how we're going to feel. But thanks. To, the uh, beloved one. The beloved one. So, But thanks, to everyone, for listening today. I've been your host, Will. You've been listening to the Raptor Show on the Sportsnet Radio Network. just want to say a big thank you to co-host Blake Murphy, producer Mark Boffel, Danielle Franceschi, board producer Derek Brendale, Jennifer Olnick, David Sis, Jared Manitai. Huge, huge day on the show. Thanks to our guests, Sam Amick, Matt Devlin, Mark Stein, Todd Ramassar, Michael Grange. We'll break it down more tomorrow.